Do you know that every day, our species consumes more than 1.5 million terajoules of energy? That's equals to 28,000 times the atomic explosion in Hiroshima. For those who live in a modern society, most of the energy we use is in the form of electricity. Shapeless and soundless. Making energy a bit like air is all around you, but you cannot feel it. You take it for granted. Until this summer, when I visited Dringur in Inner Mongolia of China, I didn't realize that I had never seen the primary form of our energy so concrete and solid before they were extracted from deep inside the Earth crust. Heidai Go, the largest open pit coal mine in Asia, is known for its high quality coal in rather shallow reserve. To better access to coal, Chen Hao's team needs to do some preparation. We are walking on 1,500 tons of an explosive called Anthol, which will move the rock layer under our feet horizontally into a nearby deep valley. You ready? First, you see it. In two seconds, you hear it. Here comes the high-density fuel that powers our civilization. A kilogram of coal can produce from 3,000 to over 6,000 kilocalories of heat. And this fascinating process of energy emitting has been largely depends on the combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with them. And carbon is the major source of heat during burning. Today, fossil fuels still supply 84% of the world's energy. A leading contributor to the rising level of greenhouse gases, the international community agrees that we are on a path towards disaster. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. A journey that can only be stopped by weaning ourselves off of our fossil fuel thirst we must reduce carbon emission on the one hand and remove those in the atmosphere on the other. Complementary efforts to help us reach net zero emissions or carbon neutrality when mankind's carbon footprint will fade from the planet. From this coal pit, my colleagues and I will embark a global journey to find out how this most difficult transition will be done while making sure mankind's lights stay on. Throughout the history of human civilization, 
we've always had a big appetite for energy of higher density. From wood to charcoal, from fossil fuels to nuclear, this trend never changed until the climate crisis forced humanity to reverse course for the first time. In one hour, the Earth's atmosphere received enough sunlight to power the electricity needs of every human being for a year. But because the Earth is so vast, that translates to about only 1,000 watts of energy per square meter of surface. Given the 20% efficiency of a solar panel, that means you will put one square meter panel under the sun and wait for about five hours then you can get one kilowatt hour. That's one unit electricity on your bill. In comparison, a power plant can finish this job by burning just 300 grams of coal. But now we have to rely on such inefficient ways to obtain such diluted energy. To compensate, we have to go big. Very big. when over 600 square kilometers of desert are covered with solar panels. It's a different story. You're looking at one of the world's largest solar farms, but it's just a fraction of a more ambitious plan of Qinghai, which includes 2,000 square kilometers of an installed capacity of 154 million kilowatts, equivalent to seven Three Gorges power stations. In fact, China has 323 gigawatts of solar capacity, around a third of the entire global total. But more importantly, mass production and research progress here have cut the panel price by 75% in 10 years. But that doesn't mean we can solve the climate crisis by covering an entire desert. Engineering and economics aside, a massive solar farm will absorb more heat than the natural sand, change the region's climate, and dramatically transform the ecological landscape. The good news is we have a lot of desert and unused land around the world. But the bad news is few people live there. So we need to invest more in grist to transfer the energy to people who need it. How can we bring renewable energy closer to us? Where space is at a premium, wind turbines are a better option. A report by the International Energy Agency has also found that a growth of wind power generation was the highest among all renewable sectors in 2021. But people want those giant blades to be smaller, shorter, and quieter. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? Very Welcome. good to meet you. In Madrid, our team met David Yaniz, whose solution is to just get rid of them. In fact, we have something like a one blade, it's a hollow tube, a vertical mast. We oscillate with the wind with the resonant. When two frequencies, the vortexes and the natural frequency of the structure start to move, uh, we have to, a way to collect energy from the wind, to transmit energy from the fluid to the structure. November 1940. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster in the U.S. taught people a lesson about a destructive phenomenon called vortex-induced oscillation. Ever since, engineers have tried their best to avoid that force of nature, until they found they could turn it to their advantage. 
the wind comes in this direction. The wind produces a physical phenomena here in which the pressure is high and low in both sizes alternatively. So at the end, vortices are produced. Prototypes are tested in this wind tunnel. Nobody has investigated how to enhance this, this process or how to absorb the much amounts of energy from, from the wind in this way. The key to harnessing wind power in such a rare way is the alternator inside. Unlike alternators in traditional wind turbines, which include a magnet and copper wire coil, the Vortex alternator is driven by just a carbon fiber rod. At Comius Pontifical University, scientists are testing all kinds of materials to their limit to see if they can withstand the oscillation, including this carbon fiber rod. We're pulling the sample, so Basically, what we check in is how much does the material stand the force we're applying. The whole material, the polymeric matrix, as well as the fibers, are stretching till some point. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it did break. Yes. Did it break? <laughs> it broke. It broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's failed. <laughs> At least we know the limit. It's very strong. And very, very strong. Uh, flexible, as in it can survive mm -hmm. the oscillation. It is much more strong than uh, what is needed for the application. Okay. One day, this technology will help us move the wind farm into the city, occupying your roof or balcony. Competition for available land is more severe in populated areas. Well, today, solar panels could be found anywhere in China. Rooftops are just old fashioned. If humanity wants to avoid the worst of climate change, we need to better get more creative about where we put solar panels. Under those panels is actually Lu Jinhua's fish pond. The solar power above has little effect on the seafood, and selling electricity can make money. It's a win-win. Compared to a massive solar farm in the remote desert, this distributed system near people is a new trend. For Mr. Liu, it's a good day for harvesting seafood. And a good day for harvesting energy. Whether it's the innovative wind power in Madrid or a creative fish pound host solar farm in Changzhou, they both bring renewable energy to populated areas. Otherwise, we need to transmit power from far, far away. There is an abundance of renewable energy out there, but power lines are massive black holes of energy. Praying for safety. Paulo Chavez will soon go up to his workplace at a height of 57 meters treading on aluminum cables, transmitting energy at 800,000 volts, double the voltage of conventional lines. Para o pessoal que não conhece, acha isso aqui um serviço, ah, você é um cara louco, trabalha numa, numa energia dessa, vai entrar dentro, dentro, dentro dessa, dessa classe de tensão. Para quem está de fora, é, é um negócio, sabe, de outro mundo, sobrenatural. The line deserves special care. At one end, 
In the heart of the Amazon jungle in Brazil's northern state of Pará lies the Belo Monte, the country's second largest hydropower station. At the other end is Rio de Janeiro, the mega city in the country's southeast. This 2,000 kilometer long line has to deliver 4,000 megawatts of energy to feed 70% of a power need there. Whether Rio can embrace more renewable energy is determined by transmission. It's impossible for the usual alternate current transmission because the wire resistance will generate considerable heat over such a long journey and resulting in a huge loss of energy. Well, Ohm's law provide a solution. You can apply a very high voltage in order to transfer energy at super low current value, thereby minimizing the energy loss over long distance. Direct -to current is better suited for the long distance job. At converter stations, voltage will be raised to 800,000 volts, which qualifies as ultra-high voltage and has to the destination without any stops. This is Belo Monte's Chinese twin in Jiangsu. The maintenance schedule gave me and anything else that can breathe, a chance to get into the very heart of it. Well, if the converter station is a still jungle, here, the valve hall, is the holy temple, hidden deep in the forest. That's where all the magic happens. Electricity is transferred at a speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. The 2,000 kilometer journey between two converter stations takes only 0.007 seconds. First, the power station generates 500 kilovolts AC. It will be turned into 800 kilovolts ultra high voltage DC at the first converter station, then has to the destination. And after thousands of kilometers of transmission, DC arrives here where all systems are instantly engaged to convert it back into AC, then transferred to the local grid. All of them needs to be done in a flash. Within those valves, where a core component called thyristors within. At the same time, tremendous heat will be generated. So those cooling pipes will be responsible to cooling the whole system down. Without them, these steel giants will be melted down one by one. A masterpiece of engineering. We have the power centers long uh, from the, the consumer centers. Like I mentioned, this is a very useful technology and the way to reduce these, these losses is the most efficient way to transmit this uh, kind of uh, energy. Outer high voltage will be reduced before the power enters real for mission accomplished. But here in Suzhou City, I saw another type of UHV, which shared the city with people. Here along this section of the Yanzu River, there is not just one megalopolis, but a group of them. A 1,000 kilovolts AC line needs to cross the river to complete a UHV loop. Because of the 
五千四百六十八点五米，我们隧道的上方就是长江。The dangers of ultra-high voltage have engineers here on constant alert. They have to guard against any small changes. Temperature, humidity, abnormal discharge, and the forces of nature. So every gap is a gap. 这么一个东西哈、啊，这个是我们一个伸缩节，我们整个管廊有五百零三个像这样的这个伸缩节。这个伸缩节它主要的作用就是一个是吸收我们这个热胀冷缩，嗯，包括我们这个隧道的这个沉降，它来吸收这个力的一些作用。所以就是像那个吸管那个中间那个拐弯的那个地方的是吧？是的。The sturdy tunnel is not as motionless as it seems. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the forces of nature. It is moving, dragged by the This is almost the only chance for humans to get so close to 1,000 kilovolts of ultra-high voltage, thanks to the protective devices. Without them, this voltage would break through the air in between and reduce us to ashes in seconds. Thankfully, I can get close enough to touch it, and if it is quiet enough, you can hear the hum of energy. Inside the insulated pipeline, filled with dielectric gas, energy flows safely through the Yangtze River. Well, this underwater tunnel and UHV infrastructure has connected Suzhou and Nantong over there, and beyond Nanjing, Hefei. Hangzhou and Shanghai. A giant energy loop has been built to encircle one of the world's most important city groups and manufacturing hubs. Huadong, 一直以来就是我们这个负荷中心。如果没有这个外来的去外来电，我们需要在当地建很多的，只能靠煤电。然后使用了我们这个清洁能源之后，这样的话就可以减少我们当地的发电厂。In China, over 30 UHV lines are in operation, linking renewable energy in the country's west to wider consumers on the east coast. But not all renewable electricity can get on those lines because of the bad temper. Of solar and wind sources, the power grid's job is to balance supply and demand at the speed of light all the time, making sure the plants generate not too much, not too little. Fossil fuels and even hydro can instantly adjust output as desired, but solar and wind are like untamed horses; they just run wild. So if too much. Or too little renewable energy enters the system when not needed, the grid will fluctuate or even collapse. That's when curtailment happens, a purposeful waste of solar and wind energy. Most of countries tackle this by keeping more reliable sources of energy production in reserve. Power plant, 
，因为整个电网它会根据每个时间段它都有个变化趋势，所以说它会有一个波动性。所以说你看四号机，它就接受它指令，它就往下减。The new challenge for this powerful generator is how to keep a low profile. 就像以我们百万技术来说，我们正常调节区间应该就是百分之五十到百分之一百。我们目前的深度调峰的这个能力啊，应该就是从百分之四十，逐步逐步，我们现在已经探到百分之二十。But if the wind drops or when the sun deeps beneath the horizon, they have to be ready to ramp up their production. But in the end, it's still fossil fuel. Pump storage hydropower can also help. Excess electricity is used to pump water to the top of these dams, where it is stored as potential energy. When it is needed, the water is released to drive turbines. The largest one of this kind, China's Fengning Power Station, proved its ability to help the 2022 Winter Olympics run on 100% renewable energy, in line with China's promise for a Green Games. However, batteries are catching up as the most scalable type of great-scale storage. CATL has supplied over 30% of global EV batteries. Now their products have a new place to go: the solar and wind farms to hook up new energy with the grid. But for now, this combination isn't cost-effective because lithium-ion batteries have a relatively low energy density. A basic science breakthrough is needed. And assembly lines have seen some inspiring improvement. This is its which unit? Now, ah, this one, we use our wood steel. We can see that the old steel was used for six and a half inches. Now it is only six and a half inches. Now it is only six and a half inches. Now it is only six and a half inches. Now it is only six and a half inches. Now it is only six and a half inches. Now it is only six and Could be packed in the same size battery cell, increasing energy density. How thick is 4.5 microns? 准备好了吗？准备好了。三、二、二、一。这么大？对，这么大。还是你卷的小一点，好像。From raw materials to a cell like this. Carbon emissions per kilowatt hour battery capacity, it's about 60 kilograms. Pan Xuexing's job is to track the carbon footprint. 制造过程中产生的二氧化碳占电池的全生命周期的话，大概百分之十到十五。嗯，啊，所以说我们很有很大部分的二氧化碳是产生来自于上游价值链。你中间涉及到碳酸锂，碳酸锂本身它有碳酸根，对，正常跟这个三元前驱体烧的时候。就会产生二氧化碳直接排出去了。那么我们这两年一直在推着上游，再去去努力的减碳降碳。If a battery is what we use to tackle climate change, it better be a product of net zero emissions. But in the eyes of Lu Wenggang, the future of grid storage has already been produced. 如果我们把电动汽车仅仅作为一个交通输送的工具，一个电池以五十度电为例，那么它在十年的使用期间里面，续航里程最多十八万公里，它只消耗三万度电，这里面还有十七万度电的储能能力没有发挥出来。Park in, plug in. And turn on the system, and Liu Wenggang can take over the batteries of his colleagues' 300 EVs. Cars will instantly become storage for two megawatts of solar panels, powering the entire factory. 
我这里面大部分都是我员工的车，那么他在上班的时候车是不动的，那么就接入到我的系统里，让我整个园区现在绿电的应用比例超过了百分之六十。With those EVs and solar panels, his factory will become a microgrid, which is a part of the city grid, participating in the more complex interaction. Energy flows through the cars, and when the shift is over, people drive home in charged EVs. By 2040, China could have 300 million EVs with a combined battery 20 billion kilowatt hour capacity equal to the electricity consumed in China for a day. I hope to make the electric car a small car that would be used to invest in the electric car. So, for the electric car, it doesn't need to be used outside. We are witnessing a revolution, but fossil fuels won't be gone overnight. So carbon emissions will be still there. But if we can store the electricity, can we store CO2? Iceland is one of the most highly active geothermal countries in the world. At the Halishady power plant just outside of Reykjavik, steam from underground creates the power, but also brings CO2 with it. Dr. Ada Eridotter is the project manager of CarbFix, pioneering a process to bury that CO2. This power plant, for example, only emits 3% of the CO2 coal burning power plant of the same size emits. Last year, we captured and injected a third of the CO2 emissions from the power plant. So how do they capture CO2? It seems very simple. Steam and hot water are pumped to the surface to generate electricity. The steam drives the turbines and is then cooled and condensed. Gases like carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide from underground are pumped out of the turbine into the scrubber and showered with pure water. Here, CO2 and other gases are dissolved and non-water soluble gases are vented. The CO2 mixture is then piped over to those igloos, which protect the two-kilometer deep injection well and equipment from the harsh winter here. Nature plays a big part. Basalt rock is cooled lava and contains calcium, magnesium, and iron, which reacts with the CO2 mixture, forming solid calcium carbonate in the rocks. So this is a core mm -hmm. we drilled into the storage formation a few years back. And then we have the white veins and spots in between, and that's mineralized CO2. And it uh, turns out that what we inject is turned into rock like this in less than two years. So it's a very efficient and effective process, permanently getting rid of CO2. Iceland is now looking at applying this technology to heavy industrial plants. Wherever there is basalt rock, this process can work. It's the most common rock type on Earth, covering around 10% of continents. And most areas within the ocean basins are underlined by basalt. On a big scale, we looked at all of the oceanic ridges. Of course, it's probably not economically to do it, but you could take all the CO2 from burning of all fossil fuel that we know of on Earth. But the ocean can have one big advantage, the large amount of water needed for this process. It takes around 25 tons to convert one ton of CO2, 
So Professor Gislason is eyeing this abandoned resource to test the CO2 mineralization in seawater. What we're doing is just a drop in the bucket. Presently, we are emitting about 40 gigatons per year of CO2. We have to be extremely focused to get going, to capture CO2 as fast as we can. And then later on, in the second half of the century, we have to clean it from air because we're not doing it fast enough. What can help us move faster is an ancient way of Mother Nature. From day one for plants, they soak up sunlight and carbon dioxide in the air to create their own fuel in the leaves in a process called photosynthesis, a way of nature to capture carbon. We need trees a lot of trees. My name is Gay Cullen and I live here in the savannah. Having been a, a pilot for over 43 years and flown all over Africa, um, you see that this area, the trees are just being denuded everywhere. Like many other areas in Africa, Kenya is losing thousands of native trees every year. One of the main drivers is the need for charcoal. Made by burning some certain types of trees, many people can't afford or get access to electricity. Teddy Kenyanjin brings an ingenious way to reverse the loss with an unexpected ally, charcoal itself. And our species choice is always, what are people cutting down for charcoal? Bring all of the seeds to char dust, where they get made with our proprietary technology that we've invented into seed balls. They collect native tree seeds and mix them with char dust. With the carbon coat, the seeds would not be eaten by passing animals. And when the rains arrive, the charcoal shell will be washed down to become nutrients. Charcoal dust, I know, is a very good amendment for the soil. High porosity, holds nutrients, holds water, microbes, and bacteria. Seed balls will be distributed to places where forest is vanishing due to charcoal making. And just throw the seed balls and let them grow. And you can do it with more creative ways. For the hard to reach areas, Seed bowling becomes seed bombing. A whistling uh, thorn acacia is what we've been spreading today. And um, the yellow fever tree, acacia, we've been spreading those. And the other tree that you see around here is the desert date. Um, I think seed boiling is definitely the way to go. And the more we can do it from the air and learn how to do it from the air, we can spread it wider. Kenya has only 7.4% forest to cover, well under the 10% minimum recommended by the UN. Since 2016, over 26 million seed balls have been thrown on the ground with the hope to turn things around. China took action earlier. Now it has the largest area of artificial forests in the world, accounting for more than one third. But monoculture makes it fragile. In Qianjiangyuan National Park, young scientists are about to take some special pictures for the trees. A basic step 
for a more ambitious goal to upgrade the artificial forest. We just use the DG's this radar to capture the whole forest landscape. How to use the DG's radar to capture the whole landscape? The forest is a complex system. It cannot be a single species. 但是哪些树种，它生长在一起，才能够实现高效的固碳，就是要靠基础研究来提供方案，实现生物多样性保护和气候变化减缓的结合。Lasers help scientists understand natural forests in a whole new way. Whether it's research work or outside observation. 都证明多样性是有利于森林生态系统生产力，有利于固碳的。But why and how biodiversity could improve carbon storage? Lu Xiaojuan manages the decade-long experiment, not in the lab, but in nature. 多样性为四的乔木药方 L 二十四零五幺五，胸径十一点三。About half of the weight of trees is carbon. The bigger they grow, the more carbon they capture. She compares sample lands from monoculture forest to forests with two to twenty-four tree species. A diverse plot with twenty-four species. Is the level of natural forest in Qianjiangyuan? We compared the natural forest with only 16 species of the native plant species. We found that after eight years, the natural forest has doubled the natural forest in Qianjiangyuan. Researchers have found that a diversified forest can establish an invisible network. Roots intertwine to exchange water and microbes. The canopy crosses and they avoid each other to maximize sunlight intake. And insects move through a network of leaves. They form one entity. 一片森林里，当多样性增加的时候，这些不同的物种之间形成怎么样的互作效应，使得它们能够各自生存，又能够最大化的互作，共同来吸收更多的养分，就是互补效应。这个时候用这个数据，你就可以，呃，重建它们相互作用的关系。任何一棵树，它长得快还是慢，和它的邻居是直接相关的。我们综合起来，在不同的海拔，我们就能够给出来比较适合的树种的组合。Nature just taught us how to plant trees. What we need is action. We in our dreams are hoping to see the highest. 但实际上，你在恢复造林的时候，碳储量升高最大的部分是从纯林到两种，所以你迈出了第一步，那后面可以朝更好的方向去发展。碳中和解决还是要靠绿色植被固碳，你总是有一方释放，一方固定，这两方的力量均衡了，你才达到碳中和。依靠。自然生态系统固碳，应该是吸收和固定这一侧最主要的一个力量。我是希望发达国家的一些专家
能够更多的关注发展中国家能力建设。我觉得，只有这样，整个世界才能够和谐，我们面临的问题才能够得到很好的解决。All of those efforts aim to bring everyone on this planet, our kids especially, a quality of life that is as good as or better than what we have now. In a short time, renewable energy could be part of the solution, but our team believes there is a far more promising long-term alternative. To find future energy for humans. An international collaboration of scientists is trying to recreate the power of the sun on Earth. Nuclear fusion is considered the holy grail of an unlimited supply of clean energy. 35 countries from around the world have come together to create a sustainable fusion reaction designed to produce more energy. Than it consumes, it's called ITER, which is Latin for the way. We have four countries: China, Japan, and the United States. In Asia, the all of the EU's member countries, and there are also the United States and China. There are seven countries. The goal is to build a 50 million kilowatt power plant with a high density generating unit. 这个反应堆呢，能够为今后的这个磁约束聚变堆啊，能够长时间的稳态运行，能够实现发电，打好一个基础。At its simplest, the sun is a huge glowing sphere of hydrogen and helium. Its extreme temperatures strip hydrogen nuclei of their electrons. Leaving the protons and electrons moving around freely in what is known as a plasma, because plasmas are a mass of charged particles, they can be influenced by magnetic fields, which is key to achieving fusion here on Earth. And that happens inside a containment vessel known as a tokamak, built to hold plasmas hotter than those found in the sun. With a very powerful magnetic field, a tokamak can actually create the temperatures needed for fusion to occur. Right now, ITER is still a giant construction project. As I say, we're going down to the first basement and then the second basement. But already spectacular in itself. So here we come into the tokamak pit, and this is where you appreciate the scale of the tokamak. This entire space will be full from ground to ceiling with the tokamak. One of the other things about fusion is, though, that making the plasma bigger makes it easier to control and easier to make the reaction. Because if you imagine you have a volume of, of plasma you're trying to heat, then the bigger you make it, then the better the surface area. So you lose less heat wasted. So the bigger you can make your tokamak, the easier it is to do fusion. So that's why the scale of ITER. The efficiency and performance of the tokamak is key, and that depends on how the plasma is created. So, as we see here, there's a central column that's like a transformer. So, you have a gas, you give some energy to it, the electrons will start to separate from uh, this gas, and once these electrons separate, they will further gain more energy, and you know they will uh, ionize another uh, hydrogen. Uh, let's say. It's a chain reaction, and you will finally get a plasma. The massive magnet will help control the plasma in the tokamak, creating a magnetic field strong enough to lift an aircraft carrier clean out of the ocean. Eater is designed to yield this plasma a tenfold return on power, or 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of input. 这个实验是不确定性很大，所有的国家在现有的装置上开展科学实验的合作，这些合作呢，就是在互相比对数据，包括空窗超环，啊，拿到了一千零二十秒这样的一个成绩，呃，还有我们的现在刚刚建成的这个环流器二 M， 呃，它也是用很短的时间。
就实现了一个照安。我们也是用我们的这种呃方案提出来，对伊特尔原来的这些方案进行修改。At Callham Center for Fusion Energy, scientists have the world's largest tokamak, Jet. Jet is a sort of a prototype、uh, of ITER. ITER has been built on the success of Jet. Yeah. Today, scientists are going to generate plasma for real. So this is a Jet、uh, experiments control room. It's like science fiction, but、yeah. it's not science fiction. It's, it's actually science. Every piece of information we get is vital. To advance fusion science, and this is one of these very important pieces of the puzzle that we need to create the scientific knowledge to run a fusion experiment like ITER. What's that sound? What you've just heard is the loudspeaker indicating that we start a new countdown. It's almost like launching a rocket. The climate is always changing. Earth is not experiencing its first global warming. PETM 就是古新世和始新世的极温期，距今大概五千六百万年之前，一个非常短暂的一个升温的时期。它是一个突然热起来的，所以有很多这个假说，有的认为是。这个大陆架上的这个温室气体突然释放啊，并没有形成一个一致的一个看法。How bad can it be? In fact, not bad. 我们看到的是一个全球欣欣向荣、非常繁荣的一片景象，多样性甚至远远高于现在。从地球演化历史来说的话，我们觉得它不是一个危机，它是一个契机。Some species disappeared, and some others occupied the niches. On the list of newborns is this little creature. The body structure reveals it was a good tree climber, but here, bones that made up his feet are the focus. We found his structure is the most important characteristic. 理论上说，它应该是像眼镜猴一样，但结果我们发现它居然有一个类人猿一样的脚后跟，它刚好处在眼镜猴跟类人猿刚刚开始分开的这个时候。Meet Achilles, the oldest known primate fossil, marking that great evolutionary moment of divergence. In the long years to come, the heel bones of some of his offspring would get shorter, and this offspring would leave the trees to walk upright on the ground, leaving a footprint like this. Yes, Achilles was our ancestor of some sort. Achilles made his debut in the global warming. Today, we have created another warming by our own hands. Can humanity hang in there, or will it fade away? Earth doesn't need saving. 
we do.